So for this class on consciousness engineering, I'm bringing you someone a little unusual. He's a man who coaches some of the world's highest performing individuals, and they pay him between $25,000 to $100,000 a year to just be their mentor and guide. See, his, this man has figured out how the minds of the world's top performing individuals work and how even if you're all the way at the top, say presidential candidate level, he gets you to go higher. He's coach, get this, presidential candidates, Hollywood film directors, he's coach world-class athletes, he's coach fund managers who manage over a hundred billion dollars in funds, he's coached the British Special Forces, he is at a whole other level as a coach. Now, he is a man called Rich Litvin. He is, in a way, the coach's coach. So coaches like me, I coach 4,000 people right now through consciousness engineering. But when I need to get myself to the next level, it's people like Rich who help me. So for this class, here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to take a man who coaches the world's highest performing individuals, bring him to you, and have him coach you. Think about what these people are paying Rich for a session like this, upwards of five to 10 thousand dollars and I asked Rich a simple question when you're talking to all these like world-class performers what are the things that are holding them back and Rich identified nine different things nine different models of the world that hold you back what he's gonna show you is how you can rid yourself of these models and when you do it means that you get to accelerate your career. Now, maybe you might be wondering, well, do these models only apply to high-performing individuals? Perhaps you're a college student just starting out or a startup entrepreneur. Well, think about it this way, right? You are going to be successful. Just the fact that you've signed up for this program means that you are on a path that's gonna take you through higher rates of success than normal human beings. And you are gonna hit these models. When I went through Rich's list, I was shocked at how many of these I was hitting, and he helped me get rid of them. So use this as a way to make sure that as you go through your success, you know the barriers which are going to come to you. These are not things you learn in school. These are the things that you will experience as you skyrocket your success and Rich is going to show you how to move them out of the way. So let's get started. Hi Rich, how are you today? Hey Vision, I'm good thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm ready for this. Uh, you tell me about your people and your people excite me. I like working with high achievers. I like working with powerful people. That's what I do as a coach and, and that's your audience. I know that. Right. And I was just explaining to Rich about uh, the quality of people that we get on this consciousness engineering program and I was telling him that it tends to be a very sophisticated audience. I know some of you who are in this program. I know that you are guys who um, just are really into personal growth and personal transformation and you like cutting edge stuff and I was explaining to Rich that I, I rather he go faster than go slower. Rich has a lot of ideas to teach as you're going to see. So I've asked him to try to go faster and to deliver more than to slow down but to make it easy for you to understand we of course will provide a PDF that outlines everything Rich talks about and since you're watching this and it's recorded you have the benefit of being able to hit the pause button if you ever feel we're moving too fast. So Rich, back to you, ready when you are. Cool. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is what I call the, the sentence. Um, each of us has a sentence that we're living into, uh, and the, the word sentence has two meanings. Uh, it's a linguistic, uh, um, uh, it's using language to, to, to create uh, a way of speaking, but there's also a prison sentence, and, and both are present in our lives and we don't see them. We're living into a sentence. There's a word or a phrase that's creating our world in every moment, in every hour, in every day. And we don't see it. Uh, you know, until I mention to the fact, the fact to you that I'm wearing glasses, I'm not aware of them. But now, in this moment, I can see little reflections on the side. I can see the frames. I'm living into a sentence. So I was talking to my friend who I think you know, uh, Sean Stevenson, a while back. And I was telling Sean about my sentence. And it's, it's simple. Mine is a question. Who am I? Who am I to be doing this? Who am I to be writing this? Who am I to be speaking this, working with these people, doing this? It's been a sentence that's run my life for a long time. Who am I? Or sometimes I hear it as, who are you? Who are you to be doing this? And it's been present for a long time. And I'm talking to Sean about this. And, and he says to me, well, who are you? And it was like that. It was an insight moment. Because it, it was like time stood still for a moment. It was a horrible experience. Because... I, I got it. 
I got it. What Sean was saying to me is I'd been living into this rhetorical question, this question I never answered. I just thought, who am I? Like, I shouldn't be doing this, and I'd use it as a way to hold me back through much of my life. And what I got in that moment is, well, I could answer the question. He was calling for me to answer that question. And it was a moment where I just, it really time stood still. You have to either own this now or it's going to own you forever. And that's what our sentences are doing. They're running us, except we don't see them. And I just knew I had to answer it. And, and I, I, it, I don't remember the moment, the words I used. I, I don't know if bad language is okay for your audience, but I had to just say, look, I'm a powerful motherfucker. I work with powerful people. I make a big impact in the world. I, I take my clients who are doing big things and I shake up their world. I help them see their world differently. I just own, I don't know what I said in that moment, but I had to own it. It couldn't just be a phrase. I had to mean it from the inside out. And in that instant, I suddenly got the power of my sentence and how I could change it. And, and the problem is that most of us, A, don't even see our sentence. And B, if we do see it, if we do hear it, then, then we haven't got a way to, to deal with it. And I'm curious, like, as we're talking, Vishen, is there one that comes to you? Is there one that's been in the background for you? You know, Rich, um, interestingly enough, I had this similar question asked to me, um, not, not by uh, an amazing author and speaker like Sean Stevenson, but by a delegate at Awesomeness Fest in uh, Thailand a couple of months back. Um, we were at a party on the beach, and she, she said, Vishen, so who are you? And I thought about it, and I couldn't really answer it because there's so many things I did. But months later, I realized who I was. I'm a teacher, entrepreneur. My mom was a teacher. She was a public school teacher. My dad um, ran a little, like, like a, a, a small little clothing retail business. And I realized I'm a teacher, entrepreneur. I always wanted to grow up and be a teacher like my mother. But I saw how tough a life she had to lead being a teacher, earning um, um, a civil servant salary, Sometimes at one point in her career, driving two hours to get to school and two hours back because she was stationed with a school that far away from where we lived. And I realized I wanted to be a teacher, but I wanted to touch millions of people. I wanted to teach stuff that really matters, and I wanted to be able to be abundant doing it. And so I took the entrepreneurial element from my dad. I became a teacher entrepreneur, and that's essentially what this is. It's essentially what Mind Valley is. It's me trying to get really powerful knowledge to the world in a massive, massive, massive way. So here's what I heard, is that you had it from a long time back, that being a teacher, there are all these things that will constrain you. Teaching is a world of scarcity. And you said, I'm going to handle that. I'm going to change teaching into a world of abundance right. and not be trapped by the hours, by the time, by the money, or a number of people I can impact. I'm going to change all that, shake it up, and actually impact millions. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you, look, you're a very self-aware man. You see that, and you have a way of turning it on its head and working with that, and, and that's powerful. And, and it, but it takes, it takes community, I've found. It, and it doesn't matter what the community is. You know, often it's my wife, and then sometimes it's the hardest thing to hear when she's telling me how I'm showing up in the world. But it's my clients, it's your community, it's my own coaches, it's, it's the, the, my men's group. I, I surround myself with powerful people who, who I ask them to call me on my bullshit. I don't like to be in an event where everyone is in admiration of me. I like to be in an event where I have this sense like, I shouldn't be here. What am I doing in this room? Because right. then I know I'm leaning into my edge. And, and that's the place for me of like leaning in all the time into this thing that scares me. And, so and, how, and that's, that's a clue. So how could, how could someone discover their sentence? And why? Why is well, that important in the first place? So let me tell you a story. I think that's, the best way to do it is tell you a story. Um, I worked last year with an extraordinary woman. Uh, she was um, uh, make a big impact in Hollywood, a director. She um, was, and she came along to me with a story. And, and her own story, you know, this is how, see, we see it in others. We can't see it in ourselves. Uh, I, I call it, um, you know, the hard lines people have about their, their world. Whatever you think of that song by Robin Thicke, Blurred Lines, it's a catchy tune and people don't always like it, but... Um, my job is to blur the lines that people think are hard. You know, uh, they'll say, well, you don't understand. Like, it's, it's hard for entrepreneurs in this economy. Well, that may be true for some, but you and I are both testament to the fact that it doesn't have to be. Um, but people come along with their hard lines. So my client comes along and she says, Rich, you don't know how hard it is for women in Hollywood. And you don't know, uh, producers and directors, it's not only hard for us, but when we get the money, it finally gets, it gets taken away from us at the last minute. And... 
she had evidence to back this up. She says, look, the last project I'm working on, uh, all the money was in place, everything was good to go, and then the, the people with the money come in at the last minute and they say, we're, we're so sorry. Uh, but Steven Spielberg said he's on board. So, you know, look, it's you or him and it's Spielberg, right? And everyone she tells this story to says, oh, my God, what can you do? You know, director of our generation. But I looked at her and said, so what? Like, like, who cares if it's Spielberg? Why didn't you look him in the eyes and say, I don't care who it is. There is only one person on the planet who should be directing this movie, and it's me. And if you need to put me in a room with him, then do so, because I need to tell him that. And there's silence. And I think, have I gone too far? Did I overstep the mark? And then she looks up at me and she says, you know what, Rich? I could have done that. And I know Steven. It's not even Spielberg to her. He knows, she knows him by his first name. Well, but here's the story behind that. You see, as a, a young child, she'd been, experienced a lot of abuse and even rape and had dedicated her life to making a difference to young children so that wouldn't ever happen again. She's done TED Talks about that. She's traveled around the world speaking about that, written books about that. And the movie was about that topic. So I wasn't overstepping the mark when I said, you are the only person on the planet who should be making this movie. And it doesn't matter what his name is. You should be doing this. And she got it. But what we had to do is dive deep in to find out, like, well, what was it that was having her have this hard line? Like when they said, sorry, we've got to take the money away from you, she'd say, oh, okay then. And... Well, what happened is that at a young age, she created this way of seeing the world, which was that if you get hurt as a young child, that's a terrible thing. So I'm going to spend the rest of my life becoming successful, playing at the top of my game so no one can ever hurt me again. And she did. And my God, she's become the, the, the top of her game. And then we had to dig deeper. And what we discovered is there was another limiting belief beneath that one, which was if you become too successful, well, then, just then, they might hurt you and take everything away from you. So in the moment when the money people took the money away, deep down, there's this sense of relief. <sighs> like, I don't, I don't have to get to that level. And, and she couldn't see it. And, and it just opened her eyes to like, wow, there's this system that's been driving me, this way of seeing the world that's been driving me that I couldn't even see. So we began to work on that and remove that from her life or handle that. And then everything began to change. That's what I do, working on what's, what's the deepest beliefs you've got that are driving everything that you can't even see. I see. And that, that's a really powerful story. So what can we do? So back to the idea of the sentence, how does that help us? And what can we do to figure out, okay, like you said, what I found interesting about what you said is we're all wearing glasses. These glasses define our world. Mm. We don't understand, though, how these glasses are limiting us. Some of these glasses are letting us see the world in a certain way, which isn't congruent with where we could be, as in the case of this female director. Come back to the sentence thing. How yeah. is that sentence thing important, and how can we remove the glasses which are not serving us? Two answers to this question. One is, the reason I do such powerful work one-on-one -on -one is like, it's me and you sitting in a room that I can draw out these things in, in right. total privacy, and, um, and, and that's, that's the first piece. The second piece is, because I work so much with high achievers, there are some distinctions about the way I've seen the way that high achievers live their life that I can go into. Now, they are generalizations, but they do really help high achievers to look at the way they see their world and realize, uh, you know, most people crave success vision. What most people don't realize is that success has a price. It comes at a cost. And the price of success is success. It's actually success that holds you back from the next level. Um, you know, the simplest way to put that is what got you here won't get you there. And, and so when I'm working with high achievers, um, the problem they're in is that if they keep doing more of what they do, they just get better and better at being at this level. If they want to get to a level beyond where they work right now, then we have to shake up the way they see their world. It's hard. It means you have to, having, having had years, even decades sometimes of success, be willing to start failing again. Because that's the only way to get to the next level. We shake everything up. So here are some of the qualities. There are nine qualities I've identified that, that hold high achievers back from the next level of success. The first one is, you're usually a, you're a powerful visionary. And, and that very power of your vision can be detrimental to your success because you can dream so big, you can get overwhelmed. You can have so many options available to you that what's called the paradox of choice kicks in. 
And it's hard to begin each new project. Um, I, I, I have that for myself right now, the paradox of choice. Um, my wife and I want to move. Um, we, we live in LA. I'm from London. We could move to anywhere in the world, literally. My job is, isn't dependent on a location. It's overwhelming. I don't know where to begin that conversation. Where shall I move to? Shall I move to Bali? Shall I, shall I, shall I move back to London? Shall I move to Spain? Um, uh, go and live. Uh, my brother lives in the Middle East. I could be anywhere in the world. We can get overwhelmed. And you put a big vision on the table. And, and that becomes too much. The very vision you have is, is what's going to hold you back from the next level. Here's the second one. You experience exponential success. And what that means is, despite the admiration of those around you, it often doesn't feel like you've ever had to work that hard for everything you've accomplished. Um, it, it, you can misinterpret the nature of rapid attainment so you can feel like you're hiding a dirty little secret. And, and most of the most high-achieving people I've ever met actually judge themselves for being lazy. I, I get people all the time telling me how, how, how much I must be doing, how busy I must be. I've got two kids. I've just spent two weeks in London. Um, I've just, I've had so much going on this year. From the outside, people think that, that I must be overwhelmed. Over here, it doesn't feel like that much vision. I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I love to do. I have a job that I love. It, and that's, that's one of the things behind. Uh, I, I, I don't know, do you have that experience too? Like where, where everyone's telling you, oh my God, how do you cope? And it's like, it's not actually that difficult over here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, get, I feel guilty sometimes when I take vacations um, because I feel, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm on vacation. I need to be building that product. I need to be getting these lessons out. There are like tens of thousands of people waiting for this content. Um, and so, yeah, that, I can totally relate to that. I took seven weeks off in January because my little baby was born. I took a month off in July because I want to take my family to England. And I kept apologizing to my team, like, I'm, I'm so sorry, I felt so guilty. And what they kept saying to me is, we love that we can make things happen behind the scenes so you can have a life that you love. And in my team meetings, I begin every team meeting with a check-in on, on um, how, how did you live an extraordinary life in the last seven days? And a few weeks ago, we got caught up because we'd just run an event, we had another one coming, there was a lot going on, and we jumped straight in, and I caught it. It was like, oh, hang on a second, guys, let's do our check-in, because... It's tempting not to. We've got so much going on. And if we do our check-in, if we say, each of us say what a wonderful life we've had, we're going to miss some things on our agenda. And because we keep our, our team, team meetings tight on time, I don't want like to run on long meetings. But I said, you know what? I don't care. We're doing this to live. We're living an extraordinary life. And, and, and that's the key. That's, the, that's, that's what comes first. Not running the business. It's in order to have an extraordinary life. And, and to me, that's really, really important. And I said, I don't care if we miss some things off the agenda. We'll handle it. Let's check in. What did you do last week that was amazing? But that's, that's, that's the thing that runs us. You're a high achiever. You have this thought in the background, like, I, I feel guilty. I feel lazy. I'm not, I'm not doing as much as I could be doing. And tell us about the others. Here's number three. Um, uh, these are competing commitments. Um, at, the more successful you become, the, the, the deeper commitments become stronger and stronger that you don't see. And that's what I just alluded to with the story I told of my client, where, where she had this commitment to being more and more successful because then she'd never have to go back to the life she ever led before. But underneath that was this secret commitment she didn't even see, which is, if you become too successful, then maybe you'll be hurt again. So I don't want to be too successful. And that's, that's like the sentence. Like, and and those, those deep competing commitments, you can't see them until you start playing the game of like, well, here's where I am, Here's where I want to get to. Let me start playing that next level of success. Here's number four. I call this the gray zone. You get comfortable in the gray zone. The, the gray zone uh, comes from sports. It refers to a pace that's set by a runner. It's too fast for recovery and too slow for growth. And a pace like this can feel like a tough workout, but running in this zone run after run will actually lead to a decline in performance. Uh, I, I watch, uh, uh, my door's open, I just keep my voice down. I watch... Uh, an overweight guy running past my house every single day. But nothing changes in his world. But he must, and he's soaked in sweat. It's a tough workout. He's running in his gray zone. Here's the challenge for a high performer. Your gray, gray zone creates so much more than the average person around you. There's a temptation to continually underperform, and you don't even realize you're doing so. And the people in your world are so in admiration of what you're doing that they can't see it. We haven't got people in our world when we perform at that level uh, most of the time, who can see that we're actually underperforming. 
And I seem to remember that, that that one resonated with you a little, the first time we talked about that. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. it, been, it's an interesting one. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. I, I have been for, in my gray zone for over a year at a time before I realized it. Yeah, and, and, and it, it, it's having... You need a mirror. There's some kind of reflection you need in your world to, to bring that back to you, to show you what's going on in your world. Like I said, I wasn't kidding. My wife is really good at this. She sees when I'm not performing at my best. She sees when I'm holding myself back. She, she doesn't believe any of my bullshit. Unfortunately, it's very, very hard to hear it from my wife. <laughs> it's so, like, no, you're wrong. So what I'd yeah. love to do after this is, when you, when, as you give yeah. us these, these, these things, this, this whole list, I'd love to go back to it and get your advice on how the people listening can shake themselves out of these elements that might be holding them back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll pause on that then. Other than being married to my wife, there are some other solutions. So right. I'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, so here's number five. This is an interesting one because it's like it, what's what drives our success. You're an extremely talented problem solver. If you're a high achiever, you've got this finely tuned ability. You scan the horizon for danger and, and, and yet, because you've, you've got this bias towards solving problems, it means you're energized by challenges and threats. So you often avoid things, taxes, relationship, income, things like that, until they get to problem level status. And then when they're a problem, it's like, well, I can handle a problem, and you dive in deep and you make it, you, you solve it. But it means you're continually creating these problems because you love that world. And, and you can struggle to, because you're doing that, um, it feels energizing, and you're astounding the people around you, but you can struggle sometimes then to focus on the longer-term goals. So again, I'll come back to that. Like you say, it's good to come back to that. <laughs> wow. Okay. So that, that's totally me. Uh, good. Good. Yeah. And, and, but but it, it, it's because you're such a high achiever, the people in your world don't see it, right? They're, they're looking at you going, it's amazing what you're creating you're actually creating the seeds for some of the problems that you can then solve and become the hero for your people and the hero in your own life again. And, and you don't even see that you're sowing those seeds with each new step of the way. Want to say any more about that? We'll, well, we'll come back to that. But that's something okay. that, that makes me uncomfortable because I know it's true yeah. about myself. Let's go on yeah. to number six. Yeah. Well, good. And I like that word discomfort. I tell my clients, you know, they, they pay a lot of money to work with me one on one. And I tell them, you need to know, like, this will not feel comfortable before you pay any money. Like working with me isn't designed to be comfortable. It's designed to be uncomfortable. Um, that's the whole purpose. If you, if you want a comfortable life, I'm not the coach for you. I'm the guy who's going to challenge your hard lines, which means the foundations on which you built your world are going to feel really unsteady for a while. And it's especially challenging if you're a high achiever at the highest level of success. Because, you know, you'll get better and better at being that level of success. You continue the way you are. I'm not interested in that game. I'll work with you to the new level of success. And the problem with the new level of success is you can't see it. You don't, it's going to start looking cloudy for a while. It's going to look like, I, where am I going? What does the world look like? You, you won't be able to see it because it's, it's just it's the next level. And, and for me, that's fun. But I do have to warn my clients, so like, that's why you need to pay me in advance, because a lot of the time you're going to say, I hate you, Rich, and they do. So let's, here we go. Let's, let's, let's carry on, right? Um, number six, you, you seek per perfection. The more success you have and the more money you make, the greater the pressure comes to keep up with that level of success. So you, the barrier to start each subsequent project becomes unbearably high, because each time it's reset to an even greater level based upon the rewards of your previous project. That, that's hard. It's like, oh my God, I've accomplished this. Now, like, now, now the barrier is even high. Now, now, like what if I fail at this next one? Now I've got it. And, and, and that, your own success becomes the challenge in itself. All right, so let's come back to um, where we began, which is your sentence, the sentence that was running your world, running your life. So as you've been listening, as you've been watching, um, some of these may have resonated with you. Some of them you may have gone, holy shit, that's me. And others... I, I can't even hear what he's talking about. Well, what I'm beginning to uncover is what are the things that run your life? What are the possible sentences that, that run you? And with a client, this is easy because I can dive in really deep. As I'm teaching you right now, as you're watching, like I, I have to go to generalizations. I have to go to the more abstract level. 
and, 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 and the, the power of being a coach is I don't live in abstractions. I live in the concrete. I live in the specifics. So, so as you hear this, play this out in your own world. Which of these are resonating for me? And then, if, if, you know, some or, or, or even none, none of these may be yours. What else is there? And, and we'll talk about this in, as we finish, because I want to come on as we wrap um, this piece on these nine characteristics vision, and we'll go back and look at how we can handle them. Um, some of the heuristics, the rules of thumb by which we can live our life, because we're living our life um, based on heuristics anyway. And, and uh, I'll, I'll use that to come on at the end about how we can see what these are and how we can create new ones for us. Number seven, you're future focused. You know, you're a, you're a high achiever, a high performer, so you have your attention firmly focused on the future. And, and you bring your future into your present moment. You literally create the future. I mean, you know, I, I watch what you do in your world. I see what my clients do. We create the future from this present moment. And that allows us to take action immediately the moment we have an idea. We don't, we don't waste time. We don't waste a moment. Stuff happens. Now, there's the flip side to that. The flip side is we rarely slow down enough to notice the impact of what I call those deja vu challenges. Those little challenges that are coming up again and again, week after week, month after month in our life, that we don't even see, we're not conscious of, unless we take time to, to slow down and see what's going on in our world and watch what are those deja vu challenges. So that's, that's the, 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 the danger of being so future focused. For everyone else, it's a gift. They can't believe what we're doing. These, I'm, what I'm, it's like the dark side of the moon. We look at the beauty of the moon, and it has a dark side. And so for each of these, they're beautiful. We could teach every, any one of these to someone to become an extraordinary entrepreneur, and they have a dark side. And that's what I'm beginning to surface right now. So number eight, you don't need help. Well, you don't, right? People are astounded by what you create. You're one of the most high-achieving people you know, and you definitely don't need support. So you're often missing out on your very own personal support team. And, and what can you do to, to bring that into your world is something that we'll, we'll look at in a moment. How do you bring that into your world? Uh, and it's not about needing help. I love this distinction between needing help and choosing help. Needing help and wanting help. We're the kind of people who don't need help. But the moment the kind of people like us say, I want help, I choose help, we take our game to the next level. Uh, I, I, I was... Uh, one of my friends said to me recently, she said, if, if you have a, a challenge that you can handle on your own, you're not dreaming big enough. And I was like, oh, I like that. I'm going to start living into that one, right? It's wow, time for a bigger yeah. team. That's a beautiful quote. Number nine is an interesting one for real high achievers because you miss out on the truth. The higher you rise, the harder it can become for you to open up with the people around you. And the higher you rise, the harder it becomes for people around you to speak their truth. Top performers can often have few people in their world willing to say exactly what they need to hear the most. Uh, you, know, the, you know, people in our world want, want to, to praise us, want to acknowledge us, want to, opportunities that, that they'll get. And, and how do we create that, that world where people aren't afraid to speak their truth to us? And we often miss out on that. We're real high achievers. So those are the nine. I'm, I'm catching myself each time to, like, to, to not go into how to handle all of those because I want to come back to it like you say. But for each of those, there is a, there, there's, a, there's a, a way to handle each of them. That's beautiful. And, and now I can't wait because um, for those of you listening, hopefully you have uh, been making a list like, like I have and making a note on what you feel were your biggest gaps. I realize right now I'm future focused. I realize right now that I'm missing a support team, um, the size of which uh, I need. I realize I'm missing out on the truth. So the, those last three completely hit me. Um, I realize I am an extremely talented problem solver and that could create chaos in my life. So now we get to the juicy part, how we can, how we can solve these barriers and how we can use them to identify our sentence. Now, some of you listening might be going, well, you know, I'm just starting out. I'm, I'm not a high achiever yet. Um, I know there are people in this program who are straight out of college and you, and obviously Rich works with some of the highest performers on the planet. Um, just to give you an idea, on average, uh, people pay him close to fifty dollars to $100,000 a year to be their coach. So these are like, um, like people in Hollywood, people who are top CEOs and entrepreneurs. Um, and you may be wondering, well, do these really apply to me? The, the thing is, Yes, because all of you are going to be going through a rise. And wouldn't it be better to be able to anticipate 
what's going to happen as you get more successful than to wait till you hit that ceiling. So, Rich, let's get let's let's go on to the next bit. Let's um, let's talk about um, how to solve these problems and how to find our sentence. Um, so. There's something really key around what you said. Uh, um, I'm writing my next book at the moment. The next book is called Brilliant. The, the 4% difference between leadership and impact. And, and there's something really interesting for me around the word impact. It, 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 everyone's talk, everyone talks about leadership, the, the power of leadership. I looked on Amazon today, 23,000 books on Amazon on leadership. But, but you can lead and not have an impact. And, and the thing about impact is it takes a second uh, think about two cars colliding. There's an impact. It's in, in a moment. An impact is when you have an insight and suddenly your world changes. An impact is when you, you spend time with your people and the ripple effect is huge. That's the piece I'm interested in. I love to work with brilliant people. Brilliant sometimes means you have a track record of success behind you. But for me, it's not, it's not just about that. Uh, brilliant people are ones who have a bias for action. Brilliant people are ones who are proactive. Brilliant people for me are ones who are problem solvers. They, they don't see uh, problems, they see solutions, and, and they, they take action quickly. So you can be 18 years old and show up from that way. It's a way of showing up in the world. It's not about uh, uh, having a resume. It's about a way of showing up. Because I can show you people with a long resume of, of, of things they've done in their world who don't have an impact. And impact is what I'm interested in when I'm looking at a client. Beautiful. So should we, ha should we go back through all this list of uh, qualities? Yes, let's go back through the list. And again, I'll inject that little note of caution. You know, I'm, I'm not a teacher in the traditional sense of the word, uh, because just like your mom, I used to be. I spent 15 years as a high school teacher, then a vice principal, and um, I, I never really loved teaching. I loved kids. I loved learning. Didn't really love teaching, and I, now I know why, because I was constrained by a curriculum or, 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 or you know, the things I had to teach. And, and what happened as I became more successful, as I became a vice principal, I didn't have to worry. No one was watching my lessons. I was watching other people's. So I began to relax. And I'd sit in the classroom. I'd get the kids in a circle, and we'd talk about our lives. And we'd, we'd have fun talking about what we were up to and our vision for what we wanted to create in the world. And then my kids would go away and come back with outstanding results. And people would say, wow, you must be a great teacher. Well, I was because I didn't have to teach them the traditional way. And the same way right now, although I'm talking about some abstracts and more general ways of being in the world. In the end, it comes down to the concrete and the specific for each individual. So, so just that note, note of caution. If you listen to that list of nine things and none resonate, I get it. It's not for you. There may be another one that comes to you, and I'll encourage you if you're listening and watching uh, to, to think about, like, well, well, what's mine then? What holds me back the most? What's my sentence? Um, you know, as I said, for a long time, mine was that simple phrase, who am I? And, 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 and it, it, you'll begin to get some insights on that. So let's have a look at these qualities, you know, uh, um, that paradox of choice, you know, being a powerful visionary um, can, can be overwhelming. And, and so it's, for me, I, I think there's a distinction, understanding the distinction between vision, strategy, and, and tactics, and at the bottom of the list is tips. And, and most people get caught online reading tips, right? Uh, 28 ways to become an entrepreneur, 28 ways to be more, more productive. Everyone's reading the level of tips. And, and then they get caught up sometimes. and like, well, they might go beyond that to, to tactics. What do I need? Is it, what's my, 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 is it social media? Is it Facebook? Is it Twitter? And then there's strategy. Well, what, what, am, what, am, what's, what am I doing in this world? And right above that, at the highest level, is vision. Um, it's the only place I like to work with them. With them with a client. I'm not really interested to do anything else. There are many, many people who do work at other levels. I'm not denigrating working at that level. It's, it's important at certain times. The place I want to come to is that level of vision. What do you want to create? Well, what I do, I do two things. I help my clients who already dream big, who already cre create big, I help them dream bigger than they've ever dreamed. And then I slow them down. And I help them take tinier steps than they've ever taken. It sounds counterintuitive, but, but dreaming big and then taking tiny steps really shifts everything. You can only ever take one tiny step at a time. You don't need any productivity advice. It's like, what's the one step you need to take right now? Then you take it, and then, then it will open up to what's the next, and what's the next. Um, so, so, but also not being afraid of fear. It, it dawned on me the other day. I've run a program for five years called the Confident Woman's Salon. 
I work with very powerful women, entrepreneurs, coaches, and I've run it for five years, and, and I did the mathematics. I've made about a million dollars just from that one program. But six years ago, maybe five and a half, I invented a program called the Creative Woman's Salon. Nobody signed up for it, Vision. Not a soul. Couldn't do anything with it. It just disappeared into nothing. Nobody. Well, then I played. And I played and changed it and created something different. It became the Confident Woman's Salon, and it's run for years now. I've been really successful. So dream big. Create that powerful vision. And then come back to the tiny step and the next one. And each tiny step will lead to success or failure. And from there, you take the next. Creative Woman's Salon didn't work. I took my next step. I turned, turned it slightly to the left. And, and the rest is history for me. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful way of, uh, of visualizing it. Take a step forward, fail, or succeed. If it fails, it doesn't matter. Take, try a different direction. And so ultimately, you're bound to get there. In the startup world, they call that pivoting. Yeah. Yeah. The problem we have these days is, especially online, because there's so much information, we're overwhelmed. You know, w w someone wants to write about the, the, the 12 steps that Mark Zuckerberg took to make Facebook a success. Right. Well, but, but what they can't see is that in that one moment where Mark was, in that moment in time, in that moment in history, with those I, I, possibilities in front of him, he took the decision for him. Um, survivorship bias, people aren't aware of. All the other people at the same moment around the planet taking the same decision as him in slightly different scenarios, it didn't work for. You can't follow Mark's step to success to live an extraordinary life, to live your extraordinary life. And that's the only life we've got. You might not be a Mark Zuckerberg, you might not be a billionaire, but you can still live an extraordinary life for you. The only way you can do it is take your next step, and then your next step, and then your next step. Mm. You know, I live in London, it can be very foggy in London. Um, on a foggy night, you might only see five yards in front of you. But you can drive five miles home, only then to see five yards at a time. Beautiful metaphor. <laughs> I like that. Um, Want to look at um, the next one, Exp yes. Exponential Success? Yes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that's a, such an interesting one for me. Um, we can feel so lazy as high achievers. Um, um, there's two parts to exponential success. Uh, uh, maybe you can put up an image of an exponential curve. Um, I'm never sure which way around the, the camera is showing it. But from my, my side here, it's a, it's, a, it's a straight line like this tipping up very slightly, and then there's this rapid curve up like this. That's an exponential line. Um, and the problem is, when you're living an exponential life, often you don't even know where you are. Like, am I living what most people live, which is an incremental life? This line stretches out into the future interminably, and you can predict for most people, if this is where you are now, I can extrapolate, this is where you're going to be in 5, 10, 20 years' time. Or are you actually living this exponential life where you have no idea whether actually tomorrow this curve is going to shoot up like that. Um, so that, that's one of the challenges of living an exponential life, is that often it feels incremental. You don't know where you are on the curve. The second piece of the challenge is, um, is you have this dirty little secret. You just, you just feel lazy. Um, for me, the answer to that is just learning to be okay with it. <laughs> it's like I've just learned that people come to me all the time telling me how much I must be doing and, and over here, it's just I've, I've, I've had to realize that it's okay because, oh, I got it. Impact. It comes back to impact. Because those two things I do have such a big ripple effect, have such an impact, that I can almost close up shop for the week. I had two conversations. Two things happened. But the impact is going to be enormous. And I don't have to. I get caught vision. As a little kid, I was 10 years old, and my parents said, you've got to revise for a, a scholarship exam for secondary school. I wasn't even sure what secondary school was, let alone an exam, let alone a scholarship exam. It was a Christmas holiday, and I had to go upstairs to my room, and all I would do is put my, my comic books behind my textbooks and pretend I was reading. And I discovered that I've played that out through most of my life. I call it busy work. I spent a lot of my time doing busy work, because my dad would walk in the room back then, and he'd look, oh, Rich is working, that's great. Do you? Um, I spent most of my life doing that. Um, the drawback to living on a computer is that it's the place we use to, to chat to our buddies, to surf the net, to read stuff, to have fun, and to do our work all in the same place. And, and so it can look like I'm working, but really I'm just filling my time. And I've learned it's okay to come in, do an hour's work, 
do something that has an impact and then pack up for the day. I coach people three days a week and three weeks a month. And that's it. There are some weeks when I'll work the other two days, some months when I work the other, other week, but I don't have to. Um, I like that. I've learned to be okay with that. Beautiful. So, so to make sure I understand this one, it's, it's about knowing that downtime is absolutely necessary and to understand that we are going to consciously feel guilty for that downtime, but that that downtime is absolutely necessary to make sure we keep performing at our, at our exponential level. Yeah, nice catch. You know, research shows that, that three places where we get our best ideas as entrepreneurs, on the beach, um, in nature, and even in the shower. And, and, you know, so really the best thing you can do, you want your business to get to the next level, is have another holiday. My God, Rich, you just made me realize something. In the last one month, I've had one of the biggest pivots in my business. Um, we, we changed strategy you know, in, in, in a really, really, really big way. And I'm so excited about this new strategy. But I realized something. Um, the month before that, I had taken my biggest amount of downtime. I went to Burning Man, uh, which is a festival in the desert for about 10 days. I then went to Dublin, Edinburgh, and London, three of my favorite cities, with my family, you know, just to show my kids the British Isles. Um, and I just realized that there's probably a huge connection. Because I came back, dove into work, work, and things completely shifted. So really, really, really good point. I've never looked at it that way before. Yeah, great catch. I, I work with clients at the level of insight. You know, you're an extraordinary man doing extraordinary things. You wouldn't need me to be on your team talking about strategy or tactics. Right. Either you know what to do or you've got people you bring in. If I was working with someone like you, it's at the level of, of vision. It's the level of insight, like in one single insight will change everything. You know, that's why my clients can pay, you know, 50, 75, $100,000 because a single insight can bring in half a million, a million, many more millions. Beautiful. So more vacations for me. Let's talk yes. about number three, competing commitments. Yeah, and, and, and that's an interesting one because that, that's not one you can really get to easily on, on, on your own. Um, it, it, it's something that really you need to have a coach or someone dive in deeper with you to see like, well, what are you actually committed to? The, the simplest way I put, to, I put it to my clients is if someone tells me I want something in my life, I want more money, I want more clients, I want a, a better business, another, another level of success, um, I, I often freak them out a little bit because I'll say to them, no, you don't. What are you talking about? Yes, I do. No, you don't. If you wanted more money, then you'd have it. If you don't have it, it tells me that you don't want it. At some level deep down, I don't know where it is right now, but when we can find it, there's a reason you don't have more money. Uh, so I think of a client I had uh, who, who lived in the Middle East who um, he, he wanted to have um, his, his business go to the next level. But he, for him, his competing commitment was his family. He, he loved his family, didn't want time away from his family. And so anytime there were opportunities to take on more business, more success, like he found ways to, to, to see them as not quite working out because what we discovered is that his family was such a priority to him, this would take him away from his family. And so you can't always see what they are in that moment. But the way to see it is if there's something you want in your life and you don't have it, it's because you don't want it. Now, that, that really is a hard one to get your head around. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I do want it. No, you don't. Because if you wanted it, you'd have it. Look at all the other things you said you wanted in your life and you made them happen. So, no, I'm not saying that's the truth. And, and what I am saying is, if you hold that as a way of seeing the world, then your world can change. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of... Um, of something that I heard from one of my other coaches, Christy Marie Sheldon. We were talking about money and why I didn't feel I was making as much money as I deserved. And she essentially said the same thing. And when she dove down into it, it was because I didn't really want that money. Because I had a, I had a dumb childhood belief that believed that, you know, um, at a certain point you don't need any more money and you should just stop giving it away. So she called it my philanthropy block. I believe that I should simply get whatever I need to live comfortably, whatever extra I should not have it, just give it away. But she pointed out to me how that philanthropy block 
was causing me to be very generous, but was really limiting my business because at a certain level, I was preventing my business from growing. Anyway, when she helped me clear that belief, I thought I wanted money, but in reality, I didn't. I had too many guilt issues associated with it. When I cleared that belief, the very next month, we had one of our most breakthrough record revenue months in the company. Made more money than I ever expected. But just wanted to point out that that is so absolutely true, what you just said. Let's go on to um, number four, the gray zone. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's that sporting metaphor about a runner running too fast for recovery and too slow for growth. The problem for us as high performers is that um, we're creating so much more than the people around us that we can actually be underperforming without even realizing we're doing so. so. So for me, handling that one is having people in my world who see me, who don't get fooled or impressed by who I am. They actually call me out on what I'm doing. Part of that for me is having a men's group. Uh, I believe for you it's going to masterminds, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and it's, uh, for me, it's, it's like the, 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 the entrance criteria for a mastermind for me is that it's the, it used to be like, oh, you know, do I fit in? Like, do I feel comfortable? Do people want me in this room? Now, if they want me in the room, then I shouldn't be there. It's the opposite. If I feel nervous to walk into a mastermind group, if I sit down and think, oh my God, these people's bios, when I hear them read out, they blow my mind. I know I'm in the right place because it's right. edgy for me and that's the only place I'm going to grow. Right. I, I started out my career using this principle. When I was first starting out, I was a kid in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and I wanted to be part of this whole personal growth publishing industry. So I joined a mastermind um, and I didn't even qualify. I joined because I was really, really, really nice to the guy who was running it. I helped him with his website and he helped get me in. I learned from the people there. I remember at first meeting, I met Ha Becker, who was like one of the greatest legends in that entire industry. But from learning from these people, I got to their level. Then I quit and I joined the next mastermind. The mastermind I'm, I'm in right now, it's, it's not really a mastermind, it's the XPRIZE Innovation Board. And this is where billionaires and philanthropists come together to fund uh, projects to help the earth. So I get to meet some of the world's wealthiest, smartest people, leading edge scientists, billionaires, and I feel small in their presence. But that's by design because it causes me to have to think in a whole different way. It's continuously lighting a fire under my butt to get out of my gray zone. So I love, love what that. you love said. That. And I love the way that Peter Diamandis thinks uh, right. abundance. It's right. a lovely way of showing up in the world. So the idea here is to join groups, not where you are equal or not to join groups where people really want you in but to join groups where you're, you, are, you actually start out as one of the smallest players. Let's go yeah. on, let's go yeah. on to number... All, all the time with my clients, I'm pushing them to, to lean into their edge. All of this, every one of these is about how do you find your edge? How do you find the place that feels uncomfortable? And keep leaning in. Let's go on to number five, being the extremely talented problem solver. Yeah. So, you know, the, the problem with that, it, it's, it, consultants know this. It's the bust cycle for consultants. They work really hard to get a bunch of clients. They do extraordinary work with their clients. And then suddenly there's uh, clients complete. And, and the, once the clients are completed, they're, they're at this stage where there's no money again. And secretly, they're driven to live in that place because that's how they show up. They're really good at solving problems. They're really good at handling dangerous situations. So they go back to this place again and again without realizing that they're creating it. They're actually sowing the seeds for these problems again and again without realizing it. Again, handling this one is awareness. Having people in your world who will call you, who will see you what, what you're creating. Uh, coaches, very powerful people who, who are... People, people you know, um, Dan Coyle, who wrote The Talent Code, uh, said that uh, you, you need, a, a coach should be someone who scares you a little bit. I love that little piece. Like someone who's like, who's really willing to see you and say what needs to be said. Because the problem often for us as high achievers is that most people aren't saying what needs to be said. And, and we'll come back to this as we come to some of the later ones. But it's, it's just having people in your world who see you and aren't afraid to call you on what's going on. So what's a practical thing that someone could, um, could, could work with over here? Okay, let's say you can't afford a coach. Is there another way that you can help avoid the extremely talented problem solver trap?
Uh, awareness is the first part of it. Um, I'd say, you know, the thing that served me best over the years, I read Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, actually when I was living in Brunei in Southeast Asia. And um, that book rocked my world. Week after week after reading that book, I did what I call a weekly review. Um, and, and it's one of the concepts he teaches. A weekly review is so simple. You just look at your week. doesn't matter what your questions are. These days I have some very powerful questions that I answer for myself. Back then I just said, like, you know, uh, how was my week? What do I want next week to look like? Mm -hmm. And then I did it. You know, what did this week look like? What did next week look like? Week after week I began to see simple things. Like I, I remember the first month I'd done it, I looked back and it was like, oh, my God, I didn't realize. Four weeks in a row I wrote, I've been watching too much junk TV. Now, I've been doing that for years. I'd never seen it until I saw it written down, and I changed it in an instant. Stop watching junk TV. Um, just so you don't need a coach. Nobody needs a coach. There are other simple ways, to, to but it comes from self-awareness. And self-awareness is one of the most important keys to being a powerful leader, actually. Most leaders don't get that. But, but that's, for me, one of the most powerful ways. Just, just a time to reflect. Uh, you talk about time in nature, time on the beach. That is for that kind of reflection. And you can carve out time for it. When I was living in Southeast Asia, I literally would be on the beach every week. I took time to go to a beautiful hotel every single week and do my weekly review. And, and, and I still do it. I see. That's beautiful. Let's go on to number five, seeking of perfection. Okay, this is number six, seeking of perfection. Oh, uh, six. There you go. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. Um, well, here's the trouble. Like, right, we, we get... Um, more and more successful and then the barrier to the next level of success becomes higher and higher because you know the level you've achieved right now right the, the business you've got right now well then who wants to start failing it, it doesn't feel good but if you're committed to living this exponential life then you have to play this game I, I wish I knew who said told this story I think it was um, uh, Seth Godin when he was a publisher um, I may be wrong, but I heard this story and I, the story resonated and I forgot to write down the name of who, who said the story. But let's say it was Seth. He had a successful published bit, publishing business and he called in his senior team and he said, listen guys, we've had the best year we've ever had. In fact, for five years in a row now, we've had no complaints. Things have got better and better and better. We're at the, the highest level of our game. So if each one of you doesn't fail at something in the next 30 days, I'm going to fire you. I just, that story <laughs> rocked me. I thought that was so brilliant. Because it takes a rare person to be able to do that. I love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's challenging. It's challenging because for most of us, we get to that level of success. We don't want to then go back to the next level. Uh, and, and at the simplest level, I remember when I was learning yoga. You know, I, I got better and better. I was doing level two, level three classes, as they called them. Every once in a while... I, I couldn't get to a level three class. The only thing I was would be a beginner's class. And I'd go. I wanted to practice. And I would see things with new eyes. And that's part of this. Like, let go of perfection. Come back to being a beginner again. Just like you walking into the X Prize and those events. Like, go back to being a beginner. Let's go on to number um, seven, being future focused. Yeah, future focused. Um, uh, you're future focused, you, you, you literally create your future from this present moment. You live in a created world. Most people live in a reported on world. Um, our, a vision, you know, I, I'd love to be an entrepreneur, but you don't understand. The economy has been so bad for the last five years. It's been one of the worst economies in recent history. Well, yeah, for some people. Um, but others I know, most people in my world, created an extraordinary year or five years in the last five years. And so if you're future focused, that's how you live your life. You create your present you bring your future into the present moment and live that future world, but you don't slow down enough to see those little deja vu challenges that come up again and again and again. So, so what serves me with that one is, is, is a rule of thumb I call slow down to speed up. And we've been touching on it already. It's those times uh, in nature where I do my weekly review. It's those times where I take time off completely from work to, to handle things. Uh, slow down to speed up is a mantra that really changed everything for me. And, and I work with my clients on that all the time, particularly if they're very powerful, very successful entrepreneurs because they're usually on such a roll that they don't realize that actually slowing down will really change everything. Because one insight for them will have such a big impact that they can afford to take less time, sorry, to take more time 
to slow down and, and, and see the shifts that they can't see at the pace that they're running. Mm -hmm. Should we move on to number eight? Yes, we can. I was just thinking about, I was just thinking about that, so, yeah. and, and I apologize. That's why there was a, uh, a pause. Um, I was thinking about how I could personally slow down and whether I really wanted that. But I think, but I think another thing that really helps over there um, is mindfulness practices. While I'm constantly speeding up, what I found is through reading yeah. books like The Power of Now, to spend 15 to 20 minutes every morning just going within and being completely in the present. Would you say that that would also be a solution? I would, and I think what, what I, my experience has been, for Westerners, is they're very hard, some of those practices. So I do something simple. I call it morning pages. I, I learned it. I forget the author who, who, who um, teaches that concept. But morning pages, every morning I sit down with my journal, I take out a fountain pen, and I write until I've covered three pages. It's stream of consciousness. I don't filter. Mm. Whatever's in my mind, I need to get out of my mind. And that's the purpose of meditation, to allow my thoughts to just kind of drift through me. So that's I have a practice beautiful. like that. That's very, very, very beautiful. I might try that too. It'll help me complete the book I'm writing faster. No. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, well, now, look, there's two pieces to that, actually. There's two pieces. One of the practices I have, sometimes with morning pages, is that it's not designed to go back to. It's stream of consciousness, I'll practice, I'll tear it up at the end. It's getting my thoughts out of me, and that's it. Now, sometimes I'll make notes in the margin like an idea for an item on my to-do list will come up or there'll be a passage I want to take out for a book that I'm writing and sometimes but I do sometimes play with like no this is just to get the thoughts out of my mind this is me clearing I'm not going back to it and literally I'll tear it up I see that that's good that's an important distinction let's go on to number eight you don't need help so you're missing out on your personal support team yeah yeah well you don't you don't the kind of high achievers I work with people like you that we don't need help but it's not about needing help. It's the, the quote I said earlier, like, like if you have a problem that can be solved, if you're on a mission that can be solved with just you, then you're not dreaming big enough. Like what if there was a mission that required a bigger team? Um, and, and for me, that's fun. It's like, it's an edge for me. Like how do I create an extraordinary team? But I'm playing with that again and again. You know, I have, I, I, I love the job titles I create for my team. I've got a director of creativity. I have a director of um, a, a client astonishment, and I have a, 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 one of my team members is called the Queen of Slow. Her, her job is to slow me down. I pay her to slow me down. And, and like, I like to pe create people in my team who have extraordinary roles and extraordinary focus. No, the director of client astonishment. Uh, sometimes in business, it's, it's so easy to think about, well, how do I connect to all the people who don't know me, who I've never met, and bring them into my world? I think that's the wrong way to look at it. What if I focus all my attention on astounding the people who are already my clients? And I have someone on my team whose job is to phone people up and say, hey, like, I haven't spoken to you for a while. What's going on in your world? How can we support you? What do you need most right now? These are my dream clients. These are the people who come back to event after event. These are the people who've been my personal clients, who've spent huge amounts of time and energy and money with me. And I want to put them at the top of my list. So I have a director of client astonishment. So I'm always looking at how do I create an extraordinary team. Got it. I see. I like that. That's and one other piece behind that. I'm also looking at like how do I create a team for the, the, the level I'm not yet at. So, you know, people in Hollywood Vision, they have someone on their team whose only job is to filter out everyone other than a few people in their world, because, you know, you're big players in Hollywood, everyone wants your time, wants your attention. They have people on their agenda, on their, on their, on their, their um, client, uh, what do you call it, uh, their, their team list, right. who, who can be paid some as a quarter of a million dollars a year, who has, might have their own house, their own car paid for. Their job is to be a filter. Well, it dawned on me the other day, well, if I want to play at that level, I should create that team first. I should create someone on my team whose job is to be that. Now, that's edgy. Like, how do I create that before I'm at that level? But I think the only way to get to that level is to create that first. Right. I, I like that. That's a really interesting idea. I might do something like that. Here's a question, Rich. So I have a support team at work. 
What about in the personal life? What about those moments when I'm feeling really down or I'm having an issue with my health or I feel like I'm, I suck um, being a, a decent enough dad for my two kids? Who's your support team then? Yeah, well, that's part of the team that I want to create. I, I want, I'm looking at it right now, a nutritionist, someone who comes and, like, I know how to eat healthy. All the information is out there online. Having the time to, to, to create healthy meals, I don't have that. And, and the truth is, I'm not so interested in spending the time to make it. I, I like to make an impact in the world. And, and for me, like, an hour with a client is going to be huge, the impact that happens compared to me spending an hour making this beautiful salad. So it's a choice I make. So I want a nutritionist on my team. You know, I've got a bookkeeper who loves what she does. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm about to, I hope he doesn't watch this, I'm about to fire my tax man. I'm about to fire my tax guy because he keeps writing to me saying, Rich, I'm so sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Here's your taxes for this year. I don't want someone who thinks taxes are a bad thing. I want someone who writes to me and says, hey, Rich, you've got to pay this amount in taxes this year. I hope you pay more next year because it will be a sign you've made a bigger impact <laughs> in the world. I like really. that. Um, and so even around the personal side of things, you know, we wanted to have our kids learn. I've got a boy who's just turned three and an eight-month-old, nine month. And we want them to be more in touch with their intuition. We want to raise intuitive kids. So I, I, I hired a woman who would help us to raise intuitive children. What I hadn't realized is that one of the only ways to do that is to learn how to become more intuitive yourself. So really, she's working with us first. But, but I'm bringing, you know, she's on my team. I hadn't thought of that until now. She's on my team, training me to how to be more intuitive, to help my kids to be more intuitive. Wow. We're struggling right now with my three-year-old um, because he's got, he keeps saying no to everything, which I love. Like, I, I should say no more often myself. But it's hard when my three-year-old saying no to everything. I actually don't know what to do. So I, I'm bringing on a, 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 a parenting coach to, to train me and Monique. We don't know how to be great parents. It's hard. So I'm, 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 I'm learning, but I'm learning how to create an extraordinary team, especially in my personal life. Beautiful. And let's go on to the final point, which is you missed out on the truth. The problem is the higher and higher that you become uh, in, in your organization, in, in, in the higher you achieve, the higher you perform, people begin to say to you the things they think you want to hear. And that doesn't serve us. We need people who speak the truth, their truth. Um, uh, there's a lovely book called um, Getting Naked uh, um, by, oh, the name escapes me. Maybe we can create some show notes. We'll put the, the links to these things in. Patrick Lencioni, oh, I've got it. Patrick Lencioni wrote a great book called Getting Naked. Um, it's a book for consultants. And uh, uh, he goes into a, a, an office to speak to the, the, the senior executive, the chief executive officer of an organization, multi-million dollar organization, and the vice president says to him, listen, before you walk in the room, you need to know our numbers were the worst numbers we've ever had. Like, please don't raise it with the CEO. Like, it really, it's a stressful time for us. He says, okay, thanks. Walks into the room, looks the CEO in the eyes and says, I hear you've had the worst quarter ever. I hear your numbers are terrible. And they then have the most real conversation they can have. And that's what we want in our world. We want people who aren't going to sugarcoat things for us. We don't need that. We want people who are going to speak the truth to us. So I train my team to do that. I train my team and I reward my team for doing so. I had a member of my team really speak her truth to me the other day about a direction I was moving in. She wrote this long letter. She poured her heart out in this letter. And I sent her a bunch of flowers afterwards to say thank you. And when we enrolled a new person in the team and we were talking about why I want people to speak their truth, I don't want a bunch of yes people in my world. What's the point of having more people who agree with what I agree with? Um, she spoke up and she said, you know what, Rich walks his talk on this one. She said, I've worked in teams in the past where people say, speak your truth, but they didn't mean it. I spoke my truth and then they filtered it out. They told me to, to keep quiet. Rich really means it. And, and I do. And, and, and you have to create that in your world. You have to encourage people to show them that you really want that truth spoken around you and to you. That's beautiful. You already gave me a couple of ideas, but I want, which I want to take back to my team. Um, this, this, this one... I, I, I know exactly what I'm going to do with it. I've noticed that there are people in my team who will write me long emails, um, t like critiquing sometimes decisions I've made and, and, and showing new parts for the company. And I always love reading those emails and it always causes me to shift things. There are other people who, um, who don't bother, maybe because they, they, they see me as too high up beyond them. But I just realized I really need to make this part of our company culture. Thank you. This is one of the biggest insights I've gotten so far. Now, back to what you were talking about earlier, the personal sentence. How do we use this to come up with our personal sentence? 
Well, let me, let me hold you. Let me hold you for a second. Let me hold you for a second. I'll come back to the sentence. One second. I want to hold yeah. this because this is really key. This is why when I work with high performers, it's not based on time. It doesn't matter how long I spend with them. People say, well, how, you know, do you work with them every week? How much right. do you pay? 75 grand? What do you do? It's like that insight could be worth millions to your business because there's someone low down on the totem pole right now who's afraid to even speak to you, but they see a problem that no one else can see. And you start creating a culture in your organization when you publicly praise someone, buy flowers for someone who wrote this long critique, share it with the team. And that one person goes, oh, I should share this with Vision. And that's going to make you millions. And, and that's going to have a big impact in the world. And, and that's why I love what I do. Because when you work with high performers at this level, it's on the level of insight. A single insight changes everything. So I just wanted to capture that. Because some, some of the people watching this will be, will be consultants and they'll be coaches too. And it's just good to see that. I like that. So let, let's, let's bring it back. Let's, let's close the loop, right? Um, we all have a sentence. There's something that's running us. There's a, there's a sentence. Uh, and it is a prison sentence. And we can't see it. And, and our, our friends see it, by the way. It's funny. I, I remember saying to sharing this with a friend, all my insights on personal growth to a guy back in London who's never done any personal growth work, never seen any of this stuff before, never read a personal growth book in his life. And I talk about this idea about a sentence and he says, oh yeah, I know that about you, about relationships. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm the expert, what do you know? And he says, oh yeah, you, you always date, this is back in my dating days, you, you, you've got this love of, of adventure. So you date these women who everyone else would think was amazing, she'd be beautiful, she'd be doing these amazing things in the world, and then you get bored and you want to go off to something else. And it was like, oh my God, he saw that in me vision. He saw this back in me when I was a teenager and then when I was in my 20s and I was dating and I had no clue. I never understood it. It was like, I have a really high va value on adventure. I I've lived my life as an adventure and I never saw how it impacted my life around relationship. So friends, people around you see it. You could begin to explain this concept to people and, and say to them, like, hey, what's mine? What do you say? What's the sentence that runs me? What's, what's the way of showing up in the world that I have that's holding me back the most? Invite that, and, and you'll be surprised at what people see, even people who don't understand about personal growth, personal development. Right. Yeah. Once we understand this sentence, what do we do about it? Um, just keep bringing your awareness to it. There's, there's two things, two ways to play with it. One is just keep bringing your awareness to it. Um, and, and, and two things will happen. Either you'll become really uncomfortable very quickly. I tell my clients this, you need to know, like one of the first things that sometimes happens when you work with a coach is life becomes really uncomfortable because you start seeing all the ways you're holding yourself back. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, did you ever watch um, Seinfeld? Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I did. I there's loved an episode Seinfeld. of Seinfeld. Yeah. So you may remember the episode when uh, George Costanza um, starts to do the opposite. Um, he's, he's in a restaurant. He's talking to Jerry. And he says, like, every time I do anything, if you try to date a woman, if I try and ask a woman out for a date, it always goes wrong. And Jerry has his insight. Well, George, like, if it always goes wrong anyway, you might as well just do the opposite of what you're already doing. And George is like, you know what? I might try that. And there's a woman sitting at the counter and he sees her looking at him and he's looking at her and he goes up to her and says, and he's about to turn away and he goes, look, I'm doing the opposite. So he does the opposite of what George would normally do. He walks up to this woman at the counter. He says, hey, I saw you looking at me. I was looking at you. Um, like, I wanted to come over and talk to you. And she says, oh, you know what? I, I was looking at your sandwich. Like, you know, look, you've ordered the same sandwich as me. I wasn't looking at you. And he's crestfallen. And he's about to walk away when he catches it and he says, he's doing the opposite, right? He turns back to her and says, you know what? My name's George. I'm single. I live with my mother and I'm fat and overweight. And she goes, hi, George. My name's Sarah. And it's like, you know what? I love that idea of doing the opposite. Where you see how your world has been created, you can actually play a game of turn it completely on its head. And, and doing the opposite. Well, here's what I'd normally do. I wonder what would occur if I did the di direct opposite of this, this week, this month. Mm, that's interesting. So then, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't have a sentence. We have multiple sentences. We do. We do. Got it. We do. Got it. And um, 
Thank you, Rich. Um, we are almost out of time, but, but this was one of the most, most interesting conversations I've had in this series. And for those of you listening, I want to apologize because at certain points it seems like I was like, like drifting off or it took me a while to reply. That was because one of the things I noticed when I listened to Rich is he gets my mind flowing in these directions. And in this call, I identified about four or five things that I realized I need to change about my life and how I run my business and how I run my private life. But my mind would keep getting these downloads. And so it would take me a while sometimes to, to, to put that down and come back to you. And I hope as you were listening to this, you got the same benefit. So here's what we covered, right? You got to listen well, to a Vision, let me, let me just add, Go on. Let me add a piece in. Let me add yes. a piece in. Because uh, it was actually hard for me having this conversation because I'd see you. Uh, I, you know, I work with people. I see where your eyes were off here. And I was aware I had two things going on. I was ha working with an audience, who, right. you guys who were watching and listening. And I could see the vision was there. And, and so I was on this track to, you know, to cover the points you wanted to cover. But I also wanted to bring you in because I could see this single insight. And I know it. That's why I work with insight. And insight can change everything. And I wanted to create space for you with that. So it was really fun to see right. that occurring in real time. Right. And, and that's why you're a master at what you do. So, so for those of you listening, this is what you just experienced. You just had one of the foremost coaches in the world. Rich is the author of the book, Prosperous Coach. He is the head of the coaching community uh, on my peer-to-peer -peer learning network, Tribe Learn. Other coaches learn from him. He works with some of the most highly successful people in the world. And what you just got is nine of the biggest gaps that Rich has noticed amongst his immensely successful clientele and a solution, a key idea to help you jump one of those gaps. So um, hope you enjoyed this. Hope you got tons of notes and you have clear ideas of what you want to implement next in your life. The best outcome you should have from this is like me. I have a list of five things I'm going to change immediately about my personal life and my business. Okay. One of those things, for example, is, is an idea I just caught here where I want to highlight a guy in my company who tells me the truth and speaks his truth to me and points out how I can improve so I can train everyone in my company to help me not miss out on the truth. That's an, an immediate action step. Hopefully you got a number as well, and I hope you got, uh, you, you, you got your money's worth with this call. Thank you so much, Rich. It's been an amazing call. And thanks all for listening. Thank you, Vision.